Mary, tell me about the BC Campus Open Textbook Project. The BC Open Textbook Project is a project in which we were funded at BC Campus to manage um, funding from the BC um, Ministry of Advanced Education to initially produce 40 textbooks in the most highly enrolled subjects in the province and then later we were funded another million dollars to produce 20 textbooks that are directed at skills and trades and healthcare and areas in which uh, as a province we have skills gaps. Before we had the Open Textbook Project, there was a major project that was a precursor to that. Can you talk about how uh, the work that you did through that project was sort of building blocks for, for where we are today? Sure, so this goes back a few years, Mary, to <laughs> 2003. Um, and at that time, online learning was becoming a major new form of education and the government in British Columbia wanted to fund the development of more four credit online learning courses and programs to offer to students across the entire province which is a huge province mm -hmm. and so students are distributed even into remote areas mm -hmm. and the other thing that they wanted to do by providing some funding was to also break down the silos of institutions mm -hmm. and enable more collaboration mm -hmm. and sharing so uh, we started out with an initiative called the Online Program Development Fund. It was mo $1 million and it was to incentivize the creation of essentially what we now call open educational resources uh, that would build out the online for credit offerings across all colleges and universities. Right. What would you say were the key um, elements of the Online Program Development Fund that really turned into building blocks for early successes with the Open Textbook Project? I think the success of the Online Program Development Fund hinged on three things. One was showing that we could build out four credit online learning courses and programs that would be then offered to students all across the province. A second was that we were able to show data about the extent of collaboration between institutions, which was a really, really critical outcome that the government was seeking. And then thirdly, of course, they always wanted to count the numbers of things that we produced and measure the extent to which they were being used and reused. And I would say that that, that really contributed to our ability early on to go out and, and start working with institutions and requiring that collaboration. They were already accustomed to that culture and already understood what the word open meant in the context of British Columbia resources. Yes, I think so. And I think that, as you know, part of it is not just culture, but practice. And so, and maybe part of culture is practice. But, but when we got going with our initiative in the early days, it became apparent that this wasn't just about business as usual. This involved new ways of working, new ways of instructional design. And we managed to also incorporate into our program some funding to support professional development of faculty and staff around how to create open education resources effectively. And, uh, and interestingly, that money also ended up producing open education resources in the form of professional development. Yeah. I think one of the other things that occurred to me while you were talking is the way that the online program development projects were assessed was by a group of people from all of the institutions in the province and we've really followed through with that with the open textbook project in terms of really ensuring that we have representation from not only um, many of the institutions but the geographical regions the type of institution and again that was a, that was a building block that was really established yeah. early on I think another thing that you're doing that is different from what we did in the early days is looking at the impact on students can you say a bit more about that as a success factor for your initiative? Yeah, and I, I guess what I would say about that primarily is one of the big drivers for us obviously has been what our Ministry of Advanced Education wants to see out of the project. And a big part of that for them is student access and student affordability. And so having those as drivers for us has meant that that, that really focuses our work. And so we're very interested in ensuring that our resources are usable by the most the largest number of instructors and faculty and therefore the largest number of students and I think that that early focus while it was difficult to work in the constraints of the top 40 it did really help because that's where students are buying the expensive textbooks and so that that was a good driver for us definitely and I think 
building off of that, I know you track savings of money for we students do. as a, one of the data points you report out we on. We do, yeah. So we track a uh, number of classrooms into which the textbooks are adopted, number of students in those courses, what the textbook would have cost if they were purchasing a traditionally published textbook, uh, all of those, and then the actual number of students. And so we have formulas that we use in taking account for the fact that students don't always buy the textbook because the textbook sure. is too expensive, so we account for that in our formula. But that is a big thing to be able to go back to government and say, we've saved students this amount of money and this many students were impacted by this work and that's really what they're interested in seeing for the most part so it helps us explain to them why there's value in the project continuing. So Mary how are adoptions going? Are faculty adopting the book? Is it widely, are books plural or are they yeah. widely in use? They are, yeah, and so we see that figure um, exponentially growing every year, and so obviously early on when our collection was smaller and it wasn't as well known, we didn't have as many adoptions, and I think I can sort of track early conversations with faculty um, through what, what we in Canada call articulation committees, which are discipline panels here, where the concept was pretty unknown what we were doing, and then going back to those groups the following year where there were already three or four people in the room who were using the textbooks and so yeah we see as as the as the collection grows as the number of faculty involved grows as the number of faculty advocates grows then we see the adoptions rising dramatically and so every year we've seen more than double the amount of adoptions across the system it increased number of we have 25 public post-secondary institutions we're now at 18 of those being involved in the project through adoption in some way or other and so that's that's a huge growth point for us. One of the more fascinating parts of your project from a student's impact point of view is the students themselves becoming advocates for mm -hmm. the use of these books. Can you say something about how that's played out and the impact it's had not only in British Columbia, the province where this is all starting from, but from other parts of Canada? Yeah, it's been really interesting and, and actually again from a government perspective what students say is very important and so the pressure from students to government to continue funding, the pressure from students to institutions and to faculty to adopt really makes a huge difference and so early on, again early on in the project I went and talked to a group of students from the Canadian Federation of Students who were really excited but not very, uh, there wasn't a lot of mobilization at that point and then as the project progressed we got student societies from some of the big research institutions institutions um, became very interested and involved and began lobbying government outside of um, our relationship with them um, so that the government would understand how important this is to students and so we've now seen that trickle across the western provinces in British Columbia at the most recent open textbook summit we had students from um, British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan doing keynote sessions that really advocate for why it matters to them as, as the ultimate consumer of the resource. Um, they want to be able to access it. They want to have the proper resources for their courses so that they ultimately can be successful. One of the questions that many people have about OER and open projects is around sustainability and I'm guessing that you had to have many conversations with our funders around how that was going to work with the Online Program Development Fund. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in the early days when before you, when I was running the program, it wasn't just about textbooks, it was about this larger context and uh, it was always yearly one-time funding. And so in order to sustain the initiative, we had to build off the successes that came from earlier rounds. There were several things that I think really made a difference. One was uh, actually tracking data. So we made um, what we call data sheets that we provided to every single institution that would show how much money did they get and what did they do with that money in terms of expanding the curricular and programmatic offerings that they all wanted to build out. And that data was really valuable for the institutions in terms of motivations to continue and also really useful for the government in terms of showing you're getting some value in return. But in addition, we, we also uh, did showcases. So we would showcase exemplars of work that had been done that was really snazzy in some way and had some appeal. 
Uh, we also did uh, workshops and training programs and, um, and we had a, a professional development group called the Education Technology Users Group and they would do sessions about the Online Program Development Fund, open education resources and, and have speakers speaking about it. So I think there was a, um, a compelling story that ended up being established. I think that ultimately sustainability is not so much about ongoing grant funding, but about baking this in to the regular daily operations of an institution and the way faculty and staff work. And ultimately that's I think what's happening. And I th we're talking about culture, right? We're talking about a shift in culture and, and we've used many of those same mechanisms including the Educational Technology User Group which is really a group of educational technologists, instructional designers and more and more faculty are involved in that group now. And that's really been part for us uh, in terms of ensuring that, that that culture continues to build. And so we've used many of those pieces as well as um, getting directly into institutions and helping people and the institutions understand how to support faculty. We've been at BC campus a very central point for the project thus far, but what we really see in the future and what we're hoping for is that this is a, a real provincial owned project and that every faculty and student across the province feels like they own these resources because they do. And so that's, that's really what we're trying to build by going into institutions and establishing groups like we have the BC OER librarians group now who are a group of librarians from a number of different institutions who have built resources for themselves and for other librarians in institutions so that when an instructor comes and says I heard about this open textbook thing they're in a position to be able to advocate for and support that so some of those same pieces are, are still in place in terms of our sustainability and that real capacity building across the system. Mary, one of the interesting things about the Open Textbook Project and even the work that I did is that while it was regionally funded by the Ministry of Advanced Education, there's been interest and adoption outside of the region. Can you talk a bit about what that interest has been from outside British Columbia and, and how they're interacting with you and how you are maybe now working with and supporting them as well. That's been a really, I, I think, one of the most exciting things about the project is the the work with other jurisdictions and, and actually not just in Canada but elsewhere as well. Um, about a year and a half ago the uh, premiers of British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan signed an MOU, Western Province MOU, and part of that was an agreement to work together on OER projects. And that resulted first in a lot of conversation. Um, we had started our project and so they were very interested in what we were doing and how we were accomplishing our goals and ultimately it's actually ended up in some formal partnerships so we are now working with um, Manitoba and doing uh, having faculty in Manitoba review the textbooks in the BC collection so that they can start getting their feet wet in and enable adoption of open resources in that province. We have the same kind of conversation happening with Alberta. Saskatchewan has brought us out to do talks at their institution because they're also very interested in moving in that direction. And so it's really nice to see that kind of spreading across the province. And the adoption data that we keep on our website is uh, only focused on the British Columbia adoptions, but it's also super rewarding to know that people from a whole bunch of other places are also making use, including people in the K-12 system, of the resources that we've produced. Mary, the open textbooks that you've been working on are becoming incredibly popular, not just in British Columbia, but elsewhere. Can you say a few words about why that is and how you got there? I think part of it is relationships, again, that you developed earlier on. And so we already had relationships at BC campus with our counterparts in other provinces. And so just as we are watching what they're doing, they're watching what we're doing. And so as people who are interested in OER, they saw the work that we were doing because we were in contact with them and had those established relationships. And so we could they could easily come and talk to us about it. I think 
One of the biggest pieces for us, however, was we were very concerned about quality and the perception of quality because there are so many, or there were so many naysayers about the quality of OER and if it's free, how can it possibly be good? So we wanted to really ensure an academic focus to our project and that's why we started with the review process. So having people who are actively teaching the subjects that would use those textbooks, evaluate those textbooks against the same criteria that any textbook book would be evaluated against and publishing those publicly made a big difference I think in terms of the academic rigor around them. We also employed a strategy of bringing faculty fellows onto our project and so we have three faculty fellows each from different institutions and institution types in our province who do advocacy work for us, who do research work for us, again things that really bring an academic focus to the project. Um, and the other thing I would say is one of the one of the ways that we've had um, a, a fairly large collection is because we only created stuff from scratch when we had to. So we went out to other jurisdictions, OpenStax for example, who have produced some very high quality resources. We brought those into our collection and instead of spending our funds on creating new textbooks, we spent it on adaptations so that the content could be localized or improved or in some way made to be a, a resource that faculty would think was of higher quality. And I think that focus on, on academic uh, rigor has been really important for, for adoption by, by faculty.